Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University and our webinar session today on Erdogan and the ambivalent nature of Turkey's religious soft power, a conversation with Dr. Ahmed Erdi Öztürk of London Metropolitan University. I wanted to spend a few minutes at the beginning just briefly telling you a little bit about the larger project of which this um, session, this webinar session today yeah, is, is, is built from. If you look at the chat room, uh, you'll see that I've thrown up um, three links um, that give you um, some further information about the uh, broader context. Um, this event today is uh, part of a larger project called the Geopolitics of Religious Soft Power. Um, it's funded with generous support from the Carnegie Corporation uh, of, of New York. And the objectives of the project are to explore various ways that governments around the world today incorporate religion and religious outreach into their broader foreign policy. My name is Peter Mandeville. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Berkeley Center. Uh, and it's been my pleasure and privilege to direct this project over the last couple of years. Um, if you wanna go ahead and take a look at the website for the project, you'll see the full range of the various publications and other outputs uh, that's come out of our work over the last few years. Um, uh, among these uh, are a series of policy briefs uh, aimed at broader foreign affairs professionals and practitioners, where we've invited a number of leading experts whose work focuses on some of the countries uh, whose um, uh, foreign policy uh, conduct tends to be of particular strategic interest to the, the policy uh, community. And uh, between July and December of this year, we're, we're publishing a series of these briefs. Um, we've done one already on I India. Uh, today's session on Turkey is our second. Uh, we'll have one on Iran uh, next month. Um, in November, we'll be looking at China uh, and we'll be concluding the series uh, in, in December uh, by exploring the ways in which Russia um, has incorporated religion into its recent foreign policy behavior. Um, our speaker this afternoon, I'm delighted to briefly introduce now, is uh, Dr. Ahmed Erdi Öztürk uh, of London Metropolitan e e University. Um, just for the sake of maximizing the time that we have with him uh, today, rather than giving a, a full introduction, um, I've gone ahead and put up a link to his uh, profile and bio in the chat room and you'll be able to get a sense of his work um, and the full list of his many, many publications. Um, the uh, conversation we're having today, as I mentioned, is uh, based on a recently published policy brief coming out of our project. Um, it's available for download from the Berkeley Center's website and again in the chat box uh, you will find a, a link to that. Before we hand over uh, to our guest speaker, I wanted to just uh, make a few brief announcements about uh, format and how the session will work today. Um, we'll hand over to Dr. Osturk for about 20 to 30 minutes of opening remarks where he'll be framing some of the key points and findings that are uh, in his, his brief. Um, and afterwards, we'll be opening up for questions uh, and discussion with him. If you'd like to ask a, a question, uh, we'd ask you to do that uh, using the Q&A function, uh, which, is, which you'll find in the controls down at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, if you open up Q&A, uh, you'll see that you can uh, type a question into a box there and it'll appear on my end. Um, and then when we uh, turn over to the, to the discussion, Discussion period, um, I'll be able to put your questions to our speaker and we we'll ask you as much as possible to be to be brief, um, just because we want to try to get through as many questions as possible and hear from as many of you as we can. Um, I also wanted to let you know that this session is being recorded um, and a recording of the presentation and discussion today will be made available shortly on the Berkeley Center's uh, website and all of you who have registered for the event will receive a link to that. So without further ado, um, it's my great pleasure to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Ahmed Erdi Ozturk. Erdi, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, dear Peter, for hosting me. I mean, it's, it's a always great pleasure for me to discuss with you under the roof of Georgetown University's 
Berkeley, Cent Berkeley Center. And indeed, it's a great honor for me to be the part of your very important comprehensive project. Uh, well, to express my claims about the ambivalent nature of Turkey's religious soft power, if you let me, as a kind of a kickoff point, I would like to give two different, well, actually incompatible uh, recent examples regarding Turkey's religion-oriented transnational state apparatus, presidency of religious affairs, the ANET, and other pro-AKP religious communities. My first example uh, is, uh, is directly about the COVID-19 process. Uh, as you know, despite various negative occurrences of the Turkey's fight with the coronavirus, Turkey offers support for numerous countries, uh, like Western countries, Eastern countries, all over the world. And if I'm not mistaken, it supplies healthcare to more than 100 countries via this transnational state apparatus. And indeed, the ANET was one of them. Uh, with this duty, uh, to the best of my knowledge, and as far as I learned from the state officials of Turkey, the ANET delivered medical assistance to some Muslim countries, such as Bangladesh and Yemen, and to some other Muslim majority countries with, with, with which Turkey shares historical bonds in the Balkans and in the North Africa. Indeed, using most of the ANET, local offices in these countries or directly delivering from Ankara. Despite all the criticism surrounding how this aid was exhibited from the Dianet and about the instrumentalization of Islam for these humanitarian activities, some scholars, journalists, experts, commentators argue that this is exactly one of the examples of Turkish religious soft power. Indeed, from my perspective, it might be a positive part of religious soft power, but there is another side of this very complicated coin, and this is very much related with my second example. The second example, my second example is about the external reflection of some domestic problems and all those use of Islam in diaspora governance as well as foreign policy. And the example comes from France. If I'm not mistaken, in the first half of 2020, French President Macron, who declared that his country, starting from the beginning of 2024, would no longer accept any imams from other nations, and particularly from Turkey, as a part of France's battle against Islamic radicalism. I mean, it is actually a shame for Turkey to be associated with the radical Islam, but France, the same France, also froze the bank accounts of the Dianic Mosque Association maintained in, his, in its country in early 2020. I would easily give some similar examples from Germany, from Austria, from Netherlands, where the has been doing has been has been doing some spying activities against the traitor of Turkey and with other Turkey originated state apparatus and with some uh, in a collaboration with some pro Erdogan religious communities since mostly from 2000, uh, 2015. When we think that currently Turkey, with it is all religious actors like formal and informal, is quite active from Russia to Cuba and serving almost all of the Muslims in the world since 1970s. But when we saw that today, Turkey ended up with, with this very complicated and multidimensional picture. I think while looking at this picture, I can easily argue that, actually I argue in my policy brief, Turkey's religion-oriented influence, Islamic-oriented influence can be defined as a religious soft power, but it can get different reactions from different actors. And within these reactions, not only Turkey's activities, but also the power relations and the hierarchies between different states are essential. I think therefore this is, this is a very important case and I think the case of Turkey is very interesting, not only for the Turkey studies, but also for the subject of religious soft power when we compare other similar examples, likewise you are doing in this project. I think to understand why and how the case of Turkey is interesting, I think we should mention about Turkey's unique sui generis secularism, namely lately, and it is transformation through the years, as well as the uh, as well as the concept term of religious soft power, which is not very well known. Let me start from the end of this uh, categorization. So please let me talk about religious soft power. I mean, pretty much everybody knows what is soft power, right? 
but we don't know about what is religious soft power very much. Joseph Nine, who coined, uh, who coined the term of soft power, says almost nothing about it, but to the best of my knowledge in the academic world, Jeffrey Haynes is the first scholar who scrutinizes the concept, right? He notes that both religion and religious actors could construct influence in foreign policy, and this influence should be defined as a religious soft power because of religion's own structure, which is true actually, but I, I, I very much like this uh, definition, but how? This is, there is a kind of a gap in this definition. And then you, Peter, uh, in 2018, uh, your long policy report, you emphasizes how transnational use of religion relies on numerous variations in the concept of soft power. And if I'm not mistaken, you gave, uh, you give us like three, four options and different answers, right? The institutional and the normative capacity of the states, their civilization capacities, the social political circumstances of the state, and indeed the ambivalent nature of the double-edged sword structure of the religious soft power is, could be one of the main determinants. And finally, our friend, our colleague, uh, Gregoria Betiza notes that countries have symbolic, cultural, and network-based religious soft powers, uh, network-based religious powers, and they might be soft power. Indeed, our friend, colleague, Peter Henne, David Robertson, have been working on these issues, but I think your definition, Betiza's definition, and the Jeff's definition, Jeffrey Haynes' definition, uh, and their combination uh, could be the good explanatory, uh, key explanatory for the case of Turkey. So in here, I think we should ask one more question to understand uh, Turkey and to explain Turkey's ambivalent natures of uh, religious soft power while using this, these three theoretical explanations. I mean, this question should be something like that. Turkey defines as a secular, like country, right? But how it can be used Islam as a foreign policy tool and, and, and it is a kind of a apparatus to control diasporas. I think uh, for this, we should walk through the, through the corridors of history and look a little bit about the uh, structure of Turkish secularism, Turkish likelihood. As you know, Turkey realized its own creation by disseminating the status of the Ottoman Empire as the caliphate of the Sunni Islam and establish a secular state in its place. But it is a top-down execution of this process and society that it doesn't have that much ability. But at the same time, this, this transformation created a kind of a unique understanding of a separation between state and mosque or Islam. And Turkey, uh, Turkey established one institution which is called Diyanet in, 2000, uh, in, in uh, 1924. And Diyanet's main aim is to control uh, Sunni Islam on behalf of state and for state. Therefore, what I would say that Turkey's laity or Turkey's secularization is not based on a uh, separation of the church, a separation of mosque and uh, state, opposite side of it, it is basically based on a very anonymous concept, which is the management of religion, controlling and managing of religion via state and for, for, the, for the political purposes. This management of state has been written a lot from Brian Turner, Ahmed Kuri, Ishtar Gözaydin, but it didn't stay like that. For example, in 1950s, Turkey's state and the policy makers, the political actors realized that, oh, religion is something that we can convert it to votes. So it started to create some, some informal collaboration with the Sunni Islamic communities. In 1970s, with the diasporization of the Turkish and the Kurdish uh, citizens in Europe, Diyanet and other uh, Muslim organizations, Muslim communities, starting to serve the European Muslims. And in 1990s, this, this, this serving activities expanded to the Balkans and Africa, uh, Africa together uh, with Diyanet and together with the religious communities. This historical journey regarding Turkey's use of Islam was the case because mostly European and the Balkan and the other nations believe that Diyanet and other formal and informal Islamic structures of Turkey under Turkey's secular like state system would be more suitable to serve the Muslims in their nations than the Wahhabi or Salafi movements. 
in here actually i should uh, i should actually have to mention one more structure to understand what is going on in currently and this structure or movement is the gulen movement as you know which is an organization that has been recently uh, got, garnered like significant controversy the movement founder, uh, founded under the leadership of Fethullah Gülen fostered the relationship with the elites of other nations by operating educational institutions uh, since from the late 1980s, 19, beginning of 1990s, and until the mid of mid of uh, 2010s. Uh, this institution, this movement, is was very active. But I mean, surprisingly, the appearance of the mayor actor arriving from abroad, the Gülen movement existed in the countries as a semi-localized. Turkish religious force, particularly after 2000s, and they became an element of Turkish soft power, religious soft power, where they operate because of their liberal language. Indeed, Gülen moment has two faces. One has the liberal face that the world saw, and the other one is the parapolitical face that, that can be seen from Turkey. What is that parapolitical face? Basically, Gülen movement aimed to infiltrate the civilian and the military bureaucracy in Turkey starting in the late 1980s and fought the Kemalist tutelage state structure in a recessive manner. Not exactly the day when AKP came to power in 2002, because AKP and the Gülen movement have been coming from a very different Islamic backgrounds, but around 2005-2016, Gülen movement and the AKP formed an unconventional and informal coalition and they became a Muslim soft power internationally because they slowly uh, reached the critical positions within the Turkish state structure and the AKP government and Turk uh, and AKP government and the Gülen movement uh, worked together and they started to be very active in the Balkans, in the Middle East, in the Africa. Uh, they became, they, they created a kind of a positive uh, Turkish Islamic soft power. But this informal unofficial coalition used Turkey's historical importance because in terms of religion, culture, civilization, and effective net network, I mean the transnational state apparatus, they try to be active all around the world in the Muslim world and also in the Muslim world. But this relatively positive image has started to change after 2011 with, with many reasons. First of all, they refused, like this, this coalition, uh, defused the Kemalist components in the state and they became alone, unrewarded. And this gives them a kind of an, like courage uh, that they believe that they can do anything they want within the, the Turkish state structure. And this, this is the beginning of the changing of the Turkish image uh, at the very beginning of 2010s. Secondly, the abandonment of the Muslim Brotherhood, which enjoys a very close relationship with the AKP government, indeed in the elite level, uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood of, seats, the, of power, they only managed to claim briefly Erdogan's gradual descent into authoritarianism with the effect of the shrinking economy following with the Gezi, Gezi protests. With all these earthquakes, all the transformations uh, has, has uh, it pushed Erdogan a kind of a transformation, and Erdogan has preferred to be a more nationalist, Islamist, authoritarian, and with this with these political attitudes, he started to transform the state structure with a via populist methodologies and uh, discourses. With all these transformations, I call uh, this process in the policy bro, uh, policy brief and in my uh, upcoming book ethno-nationalist sunnification of the state structures. Thirdly, while there was there was an ethno-nationalist sunnification of the state structure, thirdly, the the informal and the uh, unofficial coalition between Gülen movement and the uh, AKP government collapsed. The the main reason is that. This was an interest-based power uh, power relation, and the the main reason of the collapse is was again the interest-based power struggle between the Gula movement and the AKP, and which started in like mid 2012. And this 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 struggle, I think, it is still existing. There is a struggle still. There is a struggle all around the world, but change it is forms after the 2016 coup attempt. The other issue is that. Uh, this actually this all of these issues has changed 
changed Erdogan's policy making mentality and the Turkish state structure, and it has affected the instrumentalization of Islam in foreign policy. With all of these transformations, Erdogan's choice of Islam as an instrument, while the AKP grew more authoritarian, awakening a discomfort in some nations, longing for a peaceful coexistence between Islam and democracy. Moreover, there is one more part making some nations very annoyed about Turkey's activities. The transnational struggle with the Gulen movement uh, became a very big issue for foreign countries, a matter of security, as it is well beyond the Turkish borders. When we talk about the spying imams, collaboration between religious groups and the intelligence service and the Anet, these are all about, not, not only about Erdogan's extraterritorial authoritarian attitudes, but it is all actually about, Erd, uh, about the conflict between the AKP and the Gulen movement. Furthermore, I mean, I have a claim, I'm not sure whether it's a very big claim or not, but in Anatolia, None of the political actors were uh, were super were, were alone. Uh, I mean, I mean, neither the conqueror Mehmet nor the Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, and not the Erdogan sitting in a power chair alone. They've been always establishing some kind of a coalitions within the state structure. And even though Erdogan on the paper seems to running the country since 2002 alone, no, it is it is a very wrong uh, assumption. He's always very eligible to establish different coalition partners. Maybe this is one of the one of his uh, political successes, or I'm calling his as a political animal in the Aristotelian terminology. Uh, after all of these coalition earthquakes, Erdogan created a new coalition with nationalists, with the Euro-Asianists in the state, and have uh, and 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 this coalition converted Turkey more aggressive more reactive foreign policy, not proactive, not active, but reactive foreign policy, and the nationalist foreign policy under the cover of Islamism. At last, Erdogan's all of this return to the Islamic route has opened a new door of an old box, actually. The competition between some Muslim countries. Actually, this is Peter. Peter, this is your area. But the, you know, there is an ongoing competition between Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, sometimes Morocco involve all of this conflict, and Turkey. Who will be the next caliph of the global ummah? Definitely, none of them will be the next caliph of the global ummah. But there is a power race, and this, this, I mean, this, all of these races have been showing up under the cover of the religious soft power, but this competition has been going on. Who's going to control the Muslims all around the world? And this created a kind of an aggressive policy making strategies of Turkey. That is why, uh, while some countries are very happy of the Turkey's activities via religious apparatuses and the religious communities, but some others are very much hesitated to Turkey's activities because they saw it as a security problem. Uh, they saw it they, they, these activities will collapse the uh, collaboration uh, between democracy and religion. I mean, as a conclusion, all of all of these photo, I would say that Turkey, in addition to using Islam as an element of soft power, maintaining this uh, when Turkey to consolidate the domestic political strength and enduring the influence of over diaspora groups, this situation, without any questions, pertains the evolution of its state identity and to the political goals of the actors realizing this change. Indeed, but there is an exist a point that is not open to debate. Turkey during the AKP period, especially after 2010, has sought to use Islam visibly and impactfully in its foreign policy. And this has sparked the diversity of responses. What kind of responses? indeed positive and negative responses, but countries that are more economically and politically influential than Turkey, and then that have Muslims, especially Turkish diasporas, are big trouble with Turkey's political actions. But at the same time, some nations such as the, the Balkan countries that are politically and economically equal or imperial to Turkey, imperial to Turkey are very happy to Turkey's activities. There are indeed some exceptional cases likewise Saudi, South Africa, but this is the diversity. And therefore, I think it is better to, to define the 
religious soft power of Turkey as an ambivalent because there is one bright side of the coin and there is another side of the coin. But the Turkey's religious soft power is not directly about the Turkey's activities, but this is also another contribution to the literature writing. Well, I'm preferring to reading the Turkey's religious soft, uh, Turkey's religious soft power via host countries' responses because all of the literature focus on how countries act uh, use Islam or religion as a soft power tool. But what about the other's perception? My main issue is about the other's perception. I know I couldn't cover uh, some of the current domestic and foreign policy debates on Turkey, such as the uh, increasing effect of the Salafis in the domestic politics, Erdogan's de facto position as an head imam within the Turkey, and the, controver and the conversion of the old churches to a mosque, and their reflection to the foreign policy in terms of religious soft power. But I'm sure during the Q&A uh, section, we will talk a lot about Turkish domestic politics and Turkish foreign policy, because one of the main structural issues of the Erdogan regime is that the gap between, I mean, maybe the intersectionality between domestic politics and the foreign policy is getting bigger and bigger. And then what happened in domestic politics can be find a place within the domestic politics. So if we're going to talk about the Turkey's religious soft power, Turkey's religion oriented foreign policy, we should definitely know, understand the role of the actors uh, in, in, the, in the domestic politics. Thank you so much, Peter. Erdi, thank you so much. It's always such a treat to, to listen to your insightful analysis of the, these issues. Um, a, a, a welcome to those of you who may have joined us a, a little bit late. Um, we're very glad to have you uh, with us. Um, we're now going to move over to the discussion and Q&A portion of the, the program. Um, just a few reminders. Um, if you would be interested in learning more about either the a uh, larger project that this session uh, derives from, the Geopolitics of Religious Soft Power Project, or if you'd like more details about our speaker and information and links to some of his publications on these issues, or would like to read the specific policy brief that this presentation is based on, you'll find in the chat room links to all three of those. Um, if, if you'd like to ask a question, please go ahead and use the Q&A function down at the bottom of the Zoom, Zoom controls. Um, and you can type your question directly into a, a, a box um, and I'll then be able to pose it to our speaker. And we, we already have some questions coming in. Um, I, I'd like to take this, uh, this opportunity, Erdi, if I might, to ask you a couple of questions that have been on my mind as I think about the question of religion as an aspect of Turkey's foreign policy. Um, and and two, two questions in, in, in particular that, that I've been thinking about recently. Um, you know, Islam appears in Turkey's external relations in various ways and in various r registers, as you've mentioned. Um, you know, some people focus and talk a lot about Turkey's support for Islamist groups in certain regions and certain countries, particularly in the Middle East. Others focus on the enormous um, uh, upsurge in funding for mosque building activities around the world that's taken place under Erdogan's tenure. Um, others, you know, see Turkish cultural products like some of the television dramas, like Erdogrul that, you know, incorporate, Every, yeah, yeah in, in, in religious themes at times. So I want to ask, do these various facets of Turkey's religious external relations operate in an integrated fashion or does each of them have its own distinct and separate logics? So that's question one. The second question um, is actually one that I was asked in a recent webinar session where I was the uh, speaker looking comparatively at Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey and how they kind of incorporate religion into their external relations. And, and it was a question about the fact that um, in Pakistan earlier this year, um, Prime Minister Imran Khan spoke very positively about some of the Turkish television dramas and encouraged Pakistani citizens to watch these shows in order to learn Islamic culture and values. I wanted to ask what you think we should make of this and how should we understand its, its political or geopolitical significance? Um, and we've got may plenty, I, yeah, please. May, may I start from the second one? 
Sure. Uh, because, I mean, uh, the question has been asked to me, like a couple of uh, my friends, colleagues also asked me that question. And my answer was, I don't know. But right now, after exploring some resources and uh, talking some, some state officers, I can understand the picture a little bit clearly. I mean, the first thing is that actually my answer would be like quite related with your second, first question. I mean, there is a palace in Ankara right now. You should see the palace. It's a huge, enormous palace. And all the ministries, all the, I mean, the policy, the decisions have been taken within this palace. So if you're gonna think about that, the activities of the Turkey's religious uh, apparatuses, I mean, you, you mentioned about jihadists. These are, I, I mean, I don't know any evidences, but I'm reading these rumors as well. I mean, some of the, uh, in some countries, particularly in the Balkans, uh, is support, like the fact of support of Diyanet, uh, Turkey trying to establish new political parties, or supporting some political actors in the in the Western Europe, they've been also like uh, sending humanitarian aid to the some Muslim uh, diasporas. But at the same time, we know that they've been using with the uh, with some uh, some non-governmental governmental organizations and the intelligence services, all of these spying imams, and also they've been producing some uh, television soap operas, right? These are all being packed, it's a, it's a package we've been producing from Ankara, the same palace, and I'm defining all of them the uh, different fingers of the same hand. So that like the, the term of the long arm of Erdogan is very much true, very much correct. About Pakistan, when I moved to the Pakistan, I mean, Turkey is a giant country, even though currently it's economically very weak, I mean, politically, uh, they, I mean, most probably the policymakers in Turkey would be very happy about this situation, but they are alone right now. But still, they have some friends. And all of these friends are based on interests. And when you look at the military agreements and how much, how, how much uh, Turkey has been selling guns and the uh, planes and the, all the military equipments to Pakistan, you can understand why the Pakistani prime minister uh, tell that kind of verse uh, right before the Erdogan's visit to Pakistan. Because all in all, I mean, yes, Erdogan is Aristotelian terminology, Erdogan is a political animal, but at the same time, he's a very sensitive human kind and he, he thinks that he has a desire and he believes that he's been representing the Muslims and he's been doing all of these things on behalf of the Muslims on behalf of Islam. So it, this kind of sentences would make Erdogan very happy. And if Erdogan is happy, if the palace is happy, you can sign the agreements quite easily. Just think about that, how the Qatar uh, crown, Qatar, uh, Qatar prince, uh, I mean the Qatar prince and the Erdogan is a very close relations. And or think about the uh, Assad and Erdogan's uh, previous relations, they've been inviting each other in a family base, right? So to create a good relationship, to make Erdogan happy, would make you very happy in terms of some uh, some agreements. First, uh, for example, Pakistan would be one of the first countries who send them send them the Gulenists back to Turkey right after the coup attempt, without any uh, diplomatic relations, without any diplomatic uh, notifications. Directly, they send them to the to Turkey. So, I mean. Make Erdogan happy, uh, be happy, and create a very happy relations with Turkey. This is one of the issues. But on the other hand, I mean, I think this actual, uh, what is this called? There are a couple of soap operas. Uh, uh, Abdul Hamid, Abdul Hamid. It has been a kind of a. I mean, first of all, Ad, uh, when you talk with the Ottoman historians, you would realize that. And Tulu's period is an unknown period because there wasn't any written document that we know. We know the Ertuğrul er only from the Byzantium or the Western resources. So this is this is all made up, uh, made up scenario. So this is the issue. And the second issue, uh, for example, during the the the, the, the soap opera is about the uh, Abdul Hamid II. I mean. Some, some historians claim that this would be the beginning of the fall of the Ottoman Empire, and some saw that the Abdul Hamid is a hero, and Erdogan saw that Abdul Hamid is a hero, so this is, this is only one side of the history. So all of these soap operas is a kind of a, uh, kind of a soft power at the same time, but at the same time they are all made up stories and make uh, all of these populist, like, uh, populist attitudes uh, make them energize. This is this is all about it. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much. It's a much more thoughtful answer than I was able to come up with that with that same question. So let's <laughs> let's go to the Q and A box now. And our first question comes from Tuge Durak, who who says, as far as I understand, Dianet's role is more evident in Turkish diaspora in Europe and in the relationship with Muslims across the world. But what is the role of the Dianet in Turkic countries and with Turkish diasporas in Russia and in the Gulf countries? I mean, uh, yes, which is true. I mean, Dianets, like when, when Dianets uh, started to go abroad in 1970s, its main duty to, to, to serve the European Muslims. Uh, but after that, after the fall of the uh, Soviet Russia, uh, Dianet has been, uh, since then, Dianet has been supplying materials, been supplying imams, and sometimes uh, supplying like direct financial support all of the uh, Turkey countries and Dianet with the collaboration with the Turkey's uh, construction agency, Tika, uh, they've been building mosques and educating Imam with, with Turkey and then sending them back to these countries in the Turkey countries. So how I can define Turkey, not only for the uh, Turkey countries, but also the Muslim uh, uh, Balkan countries, Dianet is a kind of a big brother, all of these countries. So Dianet is the leading actor. For example, in every single year, the head of Dianet was uh, inviting all of these Turkey countries, head of religious institutions and the Balkan uh, religion institutions heads and invite them to Ankara and then uh, make, uh, make them uh, like four or five days meeting and then decide their future strategies. Dianet is a kind of a big brother for all of these, uh, all of these uh, countries. About Russia and the Gulf countries, I mean, Gulf countries, Diana doesn't have that much, uh, that much uh, activities. Maybe there, there might some activities uh, in terms of knowledge and in terms of imam exchange with the Qatar, but you know, the, the other, with the other Gulf countries, Turkey doesn't have that, that good relations. Uh, in Russia, I mean, Russia is a little bit a problematic issue because uh, pretty much like a decade ago, Dianet and the Gilam Umut tried to enter the Russian border, but it wasn't that possible. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Gilam Umut opened uh, some schools and some education centers, and they shut down by the Russian uh, Russian uh, Russian state. Right now, Dianet has an office in Russia, and if I'm not mistaken, they started to build the most, but that is all. I mean, the Russia is a part of an unknown region for Turkish Dianet, but this doesn't mean that it will stay like that because, you know, the russian turkey relations have been going uh, sometimes very good process, sometimes very problematic process. It will, I think it's an ongoing process about the Dianet, the Dianet activities in Russia. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Eredi. And Tuge, in relation to the question you just asked, um, you might be interested to look at a couple of the publications that have come out of our project. Uh, one is a commentary piece that uh, looks at uh, the sort of competition between Saudi Arabia and Turkey for influence within Muslim communities in Bulgaria. Um, mm -hmm. And the second one is a commentary piece that uh, also looks at the phenomenon of religious competition between Iran and Turkey in the Caucasus. Both, I think, may be relevant to the, to the question that, that you're posing to us. Um, so just a reminder to everyone that our session today is being uh, recorded, so it will be possible for you to access and view it later. And if you've registered for the event, you'll automatically be receiving uh, a link to that video when it goes live. So we move now to a question from Firat Gundem, who asks, is it possible to evaluate the existence of an independent Islamic religion from the official ideology of the state in Turkey? And how can we establish and understand the causality and relationship between both of them? Uh, well, first of all, I'm not a theolog, so I mean, I can't, I can't answer properly what does it mean an independent Islamic religion. But I would say that in the current circumstances of Turkey, and it wasn't like it was like that actually. Islam was never ever been an independent. Actually, it's not the issue of Islam or the Turkish state. Starting from the Byzantine Empire, uh, always there was an institution uh, within the state. Who can, which can control and regulate and manage religion on behalf of the emperor. And it happened, when, when we look at the, the Ottoman Empire period, there was a Shayul Islam, right? And Shayul Islam is the previous version of the, uh, or like the previous version of the Anet. And 
Shaykh uh, Islam is 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 directly related with the Sultan, and is, its duty is to regulate, manage, and control Islam on the purposes, political purposes of Sultan. And right now, the Yanet's main aim is to control, manage, and regulate Islam for the purposes of the uh, Turkish state. And beyond that, if I'm not mistaken, there is there are more than 35 different religious communities within Turkey. They are active in education, they are active in business, they are active in media, they are in like civil society organizations. So how you can be, how you can create a, that, in uh, how you can create an individual independent Islam with all of these atmosphere? Because I mean, when you, when any, any kind of an Islamic community, if they establish a business center, I mean, there should be something different that we define uh, to, to these institutions, right? I mean, education, that would be fine. But what about business? And we know that they have members in different political parties, uh, not only in the Justice and Development Party, or they have also uh, members in the nationalist parties. On the other hand, it is not about Sunni Islam, for example, in the Alevi communities. They have members, they have representatives in the uh, CHP. So Alevis are also not very, very independent. All the, I mean, the, the other question is that I think it's a huge philosophical question. What is independent religion? This is this is the big question, I think, and I'm not believing an independent religion, particularly in, in Anatolia, in the old Byzantine empire, uh, Byzantine lands. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And really appreciate the historical perspective that, that you brought to answering that question. So our next question comes from Baris Kezgin, who says, Erdi Hojam. Greetings from North Carolina. Thank you for this interesting, timely talk. I'm curious to hear about how Erdogan's personality and leadership traits and style relate to your research. There's now quite a bit of work that focuses on Erdogan himself. So I want to hear about his personality more in the context of your argument. Well, thank you, Boris Ujam. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear from you or uh, just hear your uh, question. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, there will be one uh, upcoming book from Hakan Yavuz. It's about the Erdogan's personality. There are lots, many, uh, many issues about Erdogan's personality. I think this is this is also beyond my uh, expertise because it's about the uh, political psychology. But what I can say uh, as a person who grew up from Ankara, uh, I mean, Erdogan is a very... Uh, Erdogan is a is a kind of a street fighter. I mean, Erdogan is businessman. If, if I'm not mistaken, he uh, the, he he publicly note that if you're gonna run a country not just before the presidential election, if you're gonna run a country properly, you should run a country. Likewise, you are running a big company. So he's a businessman. The first thing is that he's a street fighter. Just imagine that if Erdogan defined this group is a traitor, if he couldn't see any kind of an interest, he tried to uh, he he tried to kill them. I mean, kill in terms of uh, politically and socially, kill them. I mean, he's never ever uh, leaving his enemies with with only one punch. I mean, if he wants to exterminate any political enemy for him, he would exterminate. But at the same time, he's a super pragmatic uh, political actor. For example, he, quote unquote, exterminated the Euro-Asianist or the Kemalist or what's so called them uh, with the beginning of 2010s. But right now, Euro-Asianist is one of the biggest uh, coalition partner of Erdogan. We know that is this uh, blue, uh, blue homeland, all this uh, agreement with Libya and the activities in Syria, the, the uh, East Mediterranean crisis, and like all of these anti-NATO group. I mean, they were enemies of Erdogan, but right now they have been very, very influential actors within the state structure. So I would define like with three words to Erdogan, pragmatic, definitely, full of a desire in terms of everything and a very, very uh, strong street fighter. I mean, I think, uh, and, and, and very experienced political actor actually. He has been in politics since he was 16. So if, if I mean, uh, it's, it's more than 50 years he's been in politics and he, he, he know the every steps of, the, of politics. I mean, he worked in the youth clubs, he worked in the uh, local, local level, he worked in the government, he worked, as, he worked as a prime minister. Now he's controlling a giant state structure. So he's a very, a very experienced political actor. That is why most of the European political actors, particularly the European Union, the bureaucrats, can't know how to manage with this political animal. So 
he's a he's a very interesting uh, figure, and I'm very very much uh, liking to observe him as a as a political scientist. Okay, thanks, Erdi. So next on the list is another question from Tugay, actually about the UK, and I'd be very interested in the answer to this question too. But if you don't mind, um, since we've already heard from uh, Tugay, I'm going to skip this one and I'm sure we'll have time to come back to it um, and just move on to someone we haven't heard from yet. Uh, so next on the list is Imaduddin Ahmed, who asks, does the DNS serve a similar purpose with respect to Turkish communities living in the United States? Uh, yes, uh, it tried to establish with the same purposes. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they established a giant religious complex in Maryland uh, in four years ago. I had the opportunity to, to visit this giant mosque. Uh, but that, I mean, the United Nations uh, Muslim population are very much uh, different, very different than compared to Europe. And I wouldn't say that the Anet is very active in in in, uh, in 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 the United States uh, because the geography is super giant and they don't have I mean they, yes there is a Turkish population and there are many Muslims who can uh, who can get some services from Turkish Tianet but imagine that if you live in Strasbourg there is a mosque in Strasbourg if you live in London if you live in Cambridge there is a mosque in Cambridge or if you live in rugby there are some mosques in London you can go in one hour but in the United States it's not like doable to to go every single Friday from San Francisco to Maryland so the Anet's ability to reach all of the Muslims are very limited uh, in the United States and United States is not the main target of the Anet actually when we compare the Europe Balkans uh, Caucasus and the North Africa okay thanks uh, next question comes from Graham Hillman who says, you've mentioned that Turkey's soft power exports have been particularly effective in Pakistan, leading to closer political ties in the process. What other countries do you see Turkish soft power as being particularly effective in, whether it be for historical reasons, cultural reasons, or political reasons? Uh, definitely the Balkan region. Uh, after uh, 1990s, uh, Bulgaria, Albania, uh, and North, currently North Macedonia invited uh, Turkey's Dianet to serve their Muslims, to educate their Imams. And the, uh, in, in the Balkans, I mean, they've been very, very active. Uh, in, like in, uh, I would define this activity both positive ways and negative ways. For example, with positive ways, I would say that the Grand Mufti in Bulgaria is, support, is funded by the Turkish Dianet and without Turkish Dianet's uh, normative and the financial support, it's impossible for them to survive. But at the same time, we know that Turkish Dianet, it's not my uh, argument or my claim. When you read the newspapers or when you conducted some interviews with the Bulgarian state officials, we know that the same Dianet tried to divide the one only Turkish political party in, in Bulgaria into two pieces. So this is the both positive and the negative sides. On the other hand, France, where I did my PhD, I mean, there is a huge uh, Turkish and the Muslim, uh, Muslim uh, diasporas, Muslim French people, actually, and they've been served by the Anet or Turkish uh, religious supporters. They've been, they need Turkey because currently France, France uh, Islamic resources is not enough to serve them, but at the same time, we know that uh, there are some spying activities in Strasbourg, in Lyon, in Paris. So, I mean, in, when we talk influential, yes, in every single country, almost almost in every single country, Turkey, Dianet, and other religious communities pray, keep the religious communities are very active, but what kind of activity they've been holding, this is the main question. This is why I would like to define this structure as an ambivalence. Okay, great. Our next question comes from Ida Mola, and I'm going to characterize this as the greater Mediterranean relations question. Um, Ida asks about the relation, Turkey's relationship with Greece um, and how you see it evolving. And if I can maybe add to it, you know, whether there is a religious soft power or a religious diplomacy dimension to it as you see it. Uh to the best of my knowledge, there is no religious diplomacy it will be like some kind of positive. I mean, this, uh, this first of all, this current uh, situation is against beyond my uh, area, even though I'd, uh, I wrote a couple of opinion pieces about it, but this is all about the maritime, maritime law and it's all about the, uh, all about the, I mean, the, 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 the international law. But what I know that, 
Erdogan's been in a very difficult situation right now in terms of economy. When you look at the polls, he is not very good position. And one way or another, he needs to find some solutions, some glue to 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 consolidate his supporters and to enlarge his supporters. And nationalism is the best one. And if you would like to use nationalism, nationalism in Turkey, you have two countries to fight: Greece, Armenia. And I think I shouldn't say anything more after these sentences. I mean, if you would like to energize the nationalism without any questions, run to Greece or run to Armenia. And by the way, Armenia and Greece giving lots of uh, foods Erdogan to eat. So there is no, like, no one is innocent in this issue actually. But this is, this is why I'm also calling that Turkey's state structure is being transformed as an ethno-nationalist Sunnification. Not always Islam, sometimes ethno-nationalism. Sometimes Islam covers ethno-nationalism, the other time ethno-nationalism covers Islam. So this is together. And this is a perfect clue for the Turkish society because we know that according to statistics, more than 75% of the Turkish population, even though the, uh, even though the young generation who currently is very much nationalist and they believe that uh, their nationalist desires would lead them to the correct direction and so that they would like to prefer to Greece or Armenia. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next question from Lenka Tomachkova, who says, thank you very much for the insightful remarks. Could you please elaborate a bit more on the issue of um, how we should contextualize the decision regarding Hagia Sophia in Turkey's religious soft power? I mean, we, I can say that with the uh, Peter's uh, terminology, how we can define the uh, how we can define the country's religious soft powers while looking at their civilizations, right? I think the Turkey Turkey was a. I mean, I'm still believing that Turkey is a very Western-oriented country, and I have still hope. Hopes in my inside me. Maybe maybe I'm a Turkish citizen, so I would like to keep my hope. But I I don't know. I have still some hopes. But this. Hagia Sophia decision is a very good indicator. It is, yeah, it is very much related with the domestic politics, but I think uh, it will never ever change even 1% of the votes uh, on behalf of Erdogan. But at the same time, it's a huge symbol that Turkey changing its direction from Western civilization to a very, I wouldn't say an Eastern, but a Turkish side of a new kind of a civilization. Hagia Sophia is the popular example. After a Sophia decision, Turkey uh, converted many other mosques all around the Anatolia to the to the to the uh, to many other churches into to the mosque in Anatolia. Hagia Sophia is the popular example. That is all. But what about like in the north in the north Black Sea area? We have many many different Pontus churches. In all the other side in the in the in the Iskenderun area, we have many many different Syriani churches. So what happened to them? They converted to mosques. So this is a very symbolic message to the all around the world. Turkey has been changing its state identity. This is about the state identity. I mean, converting to Hagia Sophia, it's, it's about one regulation, okay? Someone will come up uh, later again as a president and they're gonna sign a declaration and it's over. But changing a state identity, if you would like to change it, one state's identity, you need a century. We know from the Mustafa Kemal Atatürk's period to here, we're almost in a century, right? You need to change a century to change the state identity, and it's a symbol to change. It's the symbol of changing the state identity. Okay, thanks, Eredi, and uh, our 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 common friend Nora Fisher Onar uh, from the University of San Francisco, who joined late, had also asked more or less the same question. So, Nora, thanks for joining us, and I, and, and I trust that that answer will, will suffice for your question as well. Um, so, our next question comes from Jesse Zito, who says. Would Erdogan like Turkey to become the titular head of Sunni Islam eventually, at least to displace any pretensions that the House of Saud has to that title? Uh, well, I think no one will be the uh, will be the head of uh, the global Ummah, but I think one way or another, Erdogan has managed to uh, spread that kind of idea in 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 all around the world. Actually, one way or another, I would like to give an anecdote if we have time, like just for two minutes. When I was conducting my uh, research in the in the Balkans for my PhD, uh, when I was in Albania, in Tirana, many uh, my interviews told me that you should go to Druze. Druze is a is a seacoast sea city of the Albania, and there is a pizza shop over there named the Recep Tayyip Erdogan. 
I said, oh, really? It's like founded by a Turkish uh, owner. They said, no, it's not a Turkish, it's a Wahhabi owner. I went to there and uh, I, 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 I ate a slice of pizza and I had a chat with the, uh, with the owner of the pizza shop and he told that, you know, I know Erdogan and I, we're not believing the same doctrines of Islam, but I believe that Erdogan holding the flag of Islam, we're wearing tie and sweat, not like ours. So if we would like to, if we want to send a message all around the world, Erdogan is the best messenger that we can find currently. I mean, how it happens when I ask, like, when I when I scrutinize uh, his ideas a little bit more, when I realize that he's watching the uh, Turkish soap operas, he's listening to the Turkish radios. I mean, he's listening to Ibrahim Taltsas without understanding anything, and he's reading some of the Albanian uh, newspapers that have been funded by the Turkish transnational state apparatus. So this is indeed in the basket of the uh, in the basket of not in not in the basket of soft power, but this is something different that we can solve, like public diplomacy or extraterritorial propaganda. I think Erdogan has been trying to create a, that kind of image, but not directly, actually. Great. Um, here's a question about Turkish politics, which is one that I, I don't think anyone can avoid wondering about, even if it's not as directly related to our discussion of religion today. It's a question from Selin Hur, who asks, what happens when Erdogan loses and or dies? What, what, what does post Erdogan, what does the post Erdogan Turkish political landscape look like? First of all, Turkish citizens will elect a new president. This is the first thing, most probably. Uh, I mean, it's it's a very difficult question. Uh, for years and years, people ask me that what happened if Fethullah Gülen will die suddenly, and my answer was, I, I really don't know. And I, I, then then I tried to give many different answers, and none of these answers have been describing the current situation. So it is a very tricky question because one of the dangerous thing for a political scientist to be a futuristic. But what I would say that after Erdogan. Turkey needs a restoration period. And for that restoration, Turkey needs clever, brilliant brains. But unfortunately, currently, Turkey pushing all of these brains to be a diaspora in all around the world. I'm not sure what's going to happen after Erdogan, but I know if Erdogan will stay more than 10 years or 20 years, nobody knows that, or there will be a post Erdogan period with some pro Erdoganists, we never know that. We will talk about, not about the religion, not about authoritarianism, most probably we will talk about new Turkeys, new diasporas, like was the Iranian diasporas or the, or the other diasporas. Turkey is, been a, has, is becoming a country, has been spreading a new kind of a very well-educated diasporas all around the world. I think this is the problem. Uh, this is the issue of problem. Then after Erdogan, if there will be a restoration period, someone needs to invite all of these brains to Turkey to restore the, restore the state institutions. But there is another issue of that. Without any institution, there will be no stability. For example, after the American election, maybe there will be a restoration period, maybe. Uh, but institutions are still there because there is a a uh, very limited constitu constitution, in the constitution, there is limits about the periods of being a president, maximum eight years, right? Within this current Turkish constitutions, I mean, I will not see any 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 end for Erdogan uh, in, the, in the short term. So if you would like to uh, restore all of these countries, you should invite these uh, brains, but for these brains, you should promise stability for that country. I think, uh, I think Turkey is about to be a failed state after Erdogan, and it will be a very difficult restoration or a, uh, will be a turbulence times for Turkey. Okay, thanks, Eredi. We're, we're getting close to wrapping up the question and answer session. So this is a last call for any questions that, that you might have. Um, I think we have enough time to circle back to the question that Tuge had uh, posed about the country where you're currently professionally based, Erdi, the United mm -hmm. Kingdom. And the question begins by observing that, um, you know, we have a couple of prominent mosques, such as the London Central Mosque built in the 1970s, with the support of various Muslim countries, particularly Egypt and Saudi Arabia in that case, mm -hmm. but Turkey was not involved. 
But last year, of course, Turkey, and over the course of recent years, Turkey has been heavily involved in supporting the new Cambridge Mosque that's been receiving so much media attention. How, how will this involvement affect Turkey's religious soft power in the UK? Uh, I mean, currently, uh, Peter, um, with our current, uh, with our common friend, Yuketa Usandal and I have been working on the uh, uh, British and the uh, US Muslims, and I've been conducting some interviews, not only about the Turkey's effects, uh, but sometimes I'm asking some questions about Turkey. It's my illness. I can't uh, control myself without questioning about Turkey. Uh, I, but I realized that Turkey is an in, uh, invisible actor among the British Muslims. But what is the issue of this Cambridge most and the not the, and the Turkish uh, not involving the 1977 most? It's all about economy actually. Right now, Turkey's state has been pre- still in terms of economy. Turkey is very weak right now. Currently, uh, one pound is ten Turkish liras. I mean, it's it's a huge devaluation in the Turkish economy day, in every single day. But what I realized that. Turkey right now, with this new state identity, we make a new decision where, where, where it will spend that money. Currently, for imams in, in the European countries and the ambassadors' salaries are pretty much equal right now. And even though there has been huge gap between the upper class and the lower class in Turkey, the, the level of the uh, like, like poverty is getting increasing and increasing in Turkey, but Turkey, one way or another, try to find that money to build Cambridge Mosque because it's it's a kind of a prestige. Turkey built the first uh, green friendly mosque in Cambridge uh, with inviting blah, 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 big names and the Erdogan speaking in front of them and praying with them. This is an image. This is the, I mean, this is a PR, like this is a PR making process for Erdogan. Like, like we have been watching all of this uh, play in every single day. So it's all about the economy and it's all about uh, PR and it's all about the new state identities preferences. Great. Thank you so much. That that about wraps up the time that we have available today. Erdi, we're so grateful to you. It's always such a pleasure to play. hear from you and to learn from you. Um, to those of you who joined us, thank you for being with us today. Again, if you look to the chat box, you'll see links uh, to all three of the policy briefs that uh, Dr. Urstuk's uh, presentation was based on today. Uh, you'll find a link also to his profile at London Metropolitan University, where you can learn more about his other publications. Um, and you'll also find a link to the Geopolitics of Religious Soft Power Project, um, of which this, this event uh, uh, comes from. Um, the project is entering a particularly active phase. We have a whole series of webinars and publications coming out in the coming weeks and months, and you'll find on the project page um, a, a place where you can sign up to automatically receive a notification whenever the project publishes um, something new or when we have an event um, c coming up. So once again, thank you very much to our speaker, um, and thank you to all of you who joined us today. Stay healthy, stay well, and we look forward to seeing you at a future event. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.